Welcome everybody to the March 4th working group uh, meeting and mini seminars. We have two uh, fine speakers lined up for today. I can't believe it's already March. It's a year since I last traveled somewhere. I'm sure other people are feeling the same thing. Uh, here in Indiana, they've just lowered the vaccination age to 50. So I'm signed up to have my first shot next week. Uh, I know that varies a lot from place to place. And I'm sure uh, you're having your own set of experiences on that. I'll remind you that uh, the meeting is going to be recorded. Uh, it's live streamed uh, and it will be made publicly available. And so please don't say anything that you don't want to be out in the public. Um, and uh, let us know if there are any issues with that. As usual, the people on the uh, organizational side are myself, James Glazier, uh, Reinhard Labenbacher as co-leads, uh, Jim Sluka, and uh, Bruce Shapiro. I'm sure you've heard from all of us in various ways. And here's our contact information. And please let us know if there's anything we can do to make this meetings or the working group work better for you. You've heard me say this again and again. We have a Slack channel. Uh, IMAG MSM has a Slack channel. Uh, we'd love to have people participate uh, in the Slack and uh, help us make it work. Uh, there's also the IMAG MSM wiki uh, that always needs love and editing. And so people's help with that would be much appreciated. Suggestions for additional content would also be much appreciated. I want to remind our speakers who are very generous in coming to speak to us that we only have on the order of 15 to 20 minutes uh, for your talks. Uh, that's a very short amount of time. And uh, I know it's difficult to say the things that you want to say in that period, uh, but these are teasers. You're always welcome to come back and present again, uh, either about the same topic or about different topics. Uh, the main goal of these meetings is to make connections, to stimulate the conversations and ideas and collaborations. Uh, and I understand that it's hard to provide, present all the technical information in such a short format. As usual, we really appreciate questions from uh, people who haven't asked questions before. There's a lot of expertise in the room and uh, we'd love to hear from all of you. Uh, in the main session, we don't have time for many questions, again, because of the format. Uh, and so we appreciate that the technical questions be held uh, for afterwards. Uh, starting last week, we had produced these post-meeting breakout rooms for half an hour after the main meeting, uh, which allow people to chat with the speakers in more detail uh, and ask those technical questions, which might not fit in the main meeting. And I will give a five minute warning to our speakers, uh, just as a reminder uh, on the time. Uh, our upcoming meetings uh, we have on March 11th, uh, Robert Stratford is going to talk to us about uh, the role of uh, PBPK modeling in drug discovery and development, more clinical perspective. Uh, Veronica Zaritsna, uh, is going to give us the first of the breakout uh, subgroup reports, a uh, preliminary report on the subgroup plan for the innate, innate and adaptive immune response. They've been making really impressive progress on that subgroup, and we're very pleased that she's willing to make a preliminary presentation of that work. Uh, March 18th, uh, we have Yadis Kivakidis, uh, who of course is very well known for his work in uh, data-based inference of uh, mechanistic rules. And we have Ashley Ford, Recipt, uh, who's going to be talking about multi-scale simulations of lung fibrosis. Uh, we are still looking for speakers for March 25th. Uh, and uh, there's a slot open for April 1st. Uh, we have some people lined up uh, coming up. Uh, Denise Kirshner has agreed to give us a talk uh, although the final schedule isn't uh, fixed for that. And uh, I'd love to hear your suggestions for future speakers. And again, uh, suggestions outside of the mathematical biology community, experimentalists who are doing interesting work that should be modeled, uh, people who are working on data sets, 
people working at other scales, clinicians who could tell us what they need for models, people in any of these areas would be most welcome. So without more ado, I'd like to turn over the meeting to our first uh, mini seminar speaker, uh, Yi Zhang. I don't know if you and are speaking jointly with uh, your colleague or whether you're going to be giving the presentation, uh, but please uh, welcome our speaker, Yi Zhang from Georgia State University. Hey, thank you everyone. Um, let me see how I figure out how to share. I'm the one going to be talking, but Ling is really the one who did all the work. That's why her name is here too. So I'm going to talk about uh, mucosillary mixing and transport, um, which according to uh, James, that's not touched upon so far. So um, let me first talk about why, uh, what's mucosillary clearance for those who are not very familiar with it and why we're interested in it. So here's the um, cartoon of our airway. When we breathe, um, particles go in to our airway and eventually to the lung. Um, particles include aerosolized, aerosolized um, virus particles and um, bacteria and dust particles and allergens, right? And those particles come in and uh, land on, flow through in the air and land on the mucus layer, the thin fluid, sticky fluid that coats the surface of the epithelium. The epithelium consists of the ciliated cells and goblet cells and some basal cells as well. The ciliated cells beat with the cilia protruding into the mucus and beat and try to move. Uh, it's like a sweep, uh, sweeping the um, mucus layer and eventually um, push the particles, the foreign particles out from the larynx. Uh, here's a, a microscopy view of a artificial tissue where you can see all the cilia beat by your eyes. And what we want to do is really want to understand where the particles go and how they move in the airway. And here's a closer look at the um, cilia. They are really these long slender protrusions from the ciliated cell into the um, apical surface. And um, they consist of uh, clusters of this, um, the clusters in the dimension of eight to 10 microns in a patch and um, uh, typically 100 to 200 cilium, cilia together. And uh, they are essentially microtubules. Uh, this ring of nine microtubule doublets um, wrapped in membrane. And they are anchored at the base and uh, wave around as the doublet microtubules um, slide back and forth against each other. That's how the uh, generate the motion. And the cilia, when they move, they have an active stroke um, that's move one way and then come back the other way a little taller. So it's really like this kind of a three-dimensional rotation, but it comes back a little taller. This kind of a, a um, cyclic um, beating and the freak with a frequency about uh, 18 to 20 hertz, depending on the animal, depending on the um, co disease conditions as well. So typical number that we use is 18 hertz for this beating. Uh, and this cilium have their uh, tip stick into the mucus. They are submerged in the, in the liquid, but there's, uh, the classical picture of that mucus is floating on top of this liquid on top of the, uh, at the tip, near the tip of the cilium. Um, but the more modern picture is that it's actually, um, the fluid is rather complex, have many different kinds of mucus, many different um, there. And we are going to treat this as a homogeneous fluid. So um, the, the field has enjoyed a very long history of mathematical models, starting from the 1950s for flagellum and oscillium, how, they, how different forces can generate that kind of a beating shape. And here's a collection of recent work at the finite element model using or using the uh, 
elastic network inside to model the dining and microtubule interaction. This is our work from a few years ago to simulate what factors um, of this beating process um, contribute most to effective transport. And here's a picture of a larger field of 400 uh, cilium acting together. And when they move, when there are many of them, they don't always move in synchrony. So you see in this shape, it's actually there's a metachronal wave as they um, move around. So those are all factors of consideration, but most of the mathematical models have been in a much smaller scale. Then the relevant tissue scale, here's a recent um, paper uh, studying human bronchial culture. And the goal was to compare between healthy and patients with asthma and COPD to see what factors uh, are changing in their um, mucociliary clearance. And they used super fast uh, microscopy to demonstrate that long and short time scale and long and, sh long and short range uh, patterns of cilia beating and mucus flow. And you can see in the centimeter scale, you see these large scale vortices in the small, maybe 10, 20 micron, 100 micron scale, you see the small uh, rotations. So uh, when we saw this paper, this during the COVID period, we had this um, uh, observation of SARS-CoV-2 target CD8 itself, and some even suggest they target goblet cells, right? So we really want to understand how virus particles move in the airway. In the beginning of the infection, as they kill, as the infection progresses, they kill the um, CD8 itself, the cell density change, the CD8 cilia density change, how that changes the um, particle movement. And if you also target the goblet cells, if you change the mucus, increasing the mucus, decrease the mucus, how that change the propagation of the particles. So our model is really to simplify the rod, uh, the cilia into simple rods. And so it's a rod with different heights rotating. And you, in this projection on the top view, you can see that they, this um, is asymmetric, not just left and right, but also um, top and down. And we prescribe its motion, it's rotating at 18 hertz, um, and the maximum length is seven microns. And then the mucus is a simple fluid that follows Stokes flow. And the interaction is between mu mucus and cilia is through that force. Um, the, um, Every par particle, every position along that rod as they move, it drives the, uh, pr it exerts a force on the fluid around it. And this is using a regularized, regularized stoke link method. Um, so we apply no stick boundary condition on the bottom that all the cilium is anchored at space and all the other boundaries are free. And we simulate a single cluster about eight micron in size, about nine, coarse grain psyllium and multiple clusters with varying spacing and multiple clusters with varying different face legs as in synchronized versus asynchronized beating. And we'll also simulate large tissue with varying um, cilia density. And here are the several uh, model parameters. And in particular, the frequency is 18 Hertz. The length of the rod is seven microns as I've mentioned. So here's a quick picture uh, when I have only one single cluster and the top row is the top view when we um, look from top down and the bottom row is the side view from the side. Um, and we color the top virtual particles, uh, layer of several layer of virtual particles blue and the bottom ones red. And there's actually on the very bottom, there are the bl black ones. And as we move in time, they beat in time, five revolutions later is 1.38 seconds later, you see this already some vortex forming and uh, our particles seem to bloom up a little in vertically as well. And uh, um, 400 revolutions later, 11.11, .11, 11 seconds later, you see this uh, very large scale a uh, rather large scale um, vortex. And with the top particles travel a lot further than the bottom particles. And the, really the black ones near the bottom, they hardly moved at all. 
So we actually see the overall the particles moved in the lower left and lower um, bottom left lower left direction. And then they also moved up a little direction, right? There's mixing and there's some uh, transport. Uh, so in order to see how they move around, we use the mean square displacement just to um, remind everybody the mean square displacement is given the time interval, you average the uh, distance squared. And if that's uh, linear in time, the time interval, it's a normal diffusion. And if it bends up with the um, coefficient greater than zero, then it's super diffusion. That's uh, advection and other uh, drift um, associated with it. If it's uh, less than one, it's sub diffusion. You can see it's a damped, jammed, or, or caged in uh, motion. So we can see in our different layers, we just catch the uh, average behavior for different z equals one is near the bottom, z equals three is uh, closer to the uh, up, um, z equals to five and z equals to seven is really closer to the tip. And we see all of them perform rather simple uh, normal diffusion, except for the bottom that ones that are almost stuck. So um, when we put these three clusters together and we color the different, these virtual particles in different colors, and the top view, you can see the particles uh, from the left being switched from the bottom, right? So the whole thing is actually going in this uh, counterclockwise cycle, right? The, all, every single cilium is beating in counterclockwise. And then when they beat together, you see all these uh, particles, the whole, field is being stirred to generate these counterclockwise swirls. And in 11 seconds, you can see some green particles that's on the left, on the rightmost, now travel very far to the left. And the black particles on the left have traveled mostly along this direction and some of them actually made all the way to the right, right? So there's a lot of mixing and there's some segregation of, there's the color stripes, right? So it's some kind of a segregation of, um, of layers um, or, or of um, particle travel. And if you look at the side view, you can see lots of mixing and also some transport upwards. So as they stir around, the, the uh, particles tend to be lifted up and then tend to be uh, pushed in the negative x and negative y direction. So that's sort of the observation when the clusters are closer together and the, all the um, cilia beat in synchrony. And when we push them far apart, now I have to change the view a little bit. The top view now in the left column and side view is on the right column. As a function of time, again, you can see uh, this is the center of my cluster and my cluster is about this size. And these are the particles in the neighborhood. And you can see effectively they don't mix up that much. Um, if they are far apart, so my own stirring doesn't uh, affect the, the, the guys farther away. And uh, um, same goes in the side view. The vertically, you don't have too much mixing. Horizontally, you don't have too much mixing, not too much transport. Um, and we, if we plot everything, the center of mass in X, in Y, and in Z, um, for those particles as a function of their distancing between, between um, these clusters. We can see that if they are close together, they have the maximum um, transport in the Y direction and Z direction. So in Y and Z directions, they have sort of the further apart, the, the smaller the uh, motion, the, the transport. But in X direction, that's actually the direction that we want the directed transport, that well, the direction that's out of the airway that you can see the uh, smallest distancing does not provide the most uh, tra directed transport. It's an intermediate. The distance equals to 5D versus uh, 7D that actually provides higher, um, more, more displacement, center of mass movement. 
So that's interesting. So we proposed as a, a optimal distancing for effective transport. It's like the tandem of uh, transfer. I have to move my particle this way and for you to carry it over. And that's the, um, that's the relay game. There's the optimal distancing in between. And if the if the cilia, if the clusters don't beat in synchrony, this is the picture that we saw the in synchrony, they have a lot of mixing, a lot of transport. And if we have the different phase lag between these different uh, clusters, and you can see that they have less movement and they have more mixing. And in particular, in particular, in this case, that um, the movement, the uh, transport from one cluster effective cancel the other, that they end up with only mixing and no, um, no transport at all. So we can plot that, summarize the results, and uh, effectively there's asynchronous beating enhanced mixing but reduced transport. And we can look at uh, the mean square displacement as a function of these different spacing and also as a function of different layers in our particle. And we see super spread, super diffusion in the top layers and um, depending on their distance, actually different layers have more super, diff um, more convection, advection, um, and that's spatially distributed uh, movements. Uh, another thing that we looked at was uh, using replicate function to see um, clustering or, or uh, dispersion from these particles because we see some kind of a color aggregates and we wanted to see whether they um, over a long time they actually cluster or they disperse. And this is the interpretation of this replicate function. And we see when we have, it's very hard to read, but the reference line, the gray line is our initial grid lock, uh, grid line, grid. And in 3D, we'll see everything is below the uh, reference line. So it suggests when the clusters are close together in time, they actually, there's an overall dispersion. Um, in this intermediate spacing, it's overall clustering. And when they are very far apart, they don't effectively, they don't have much, they don't have either dispersion or, or uh, re, they don't have no dis redistribution of these particles. So this intermediate clustering, uh, I don't know yet how to relate it to this intermediate spacing that's most effective transport, how clustering is connected to uh, uh, transport. So that's uh, something we're still trying to figure out. And the last picture is with different density. This is the 20% density of these clusters at a large tissue scale. This is 100 by 100 um, microns. You can see a lot of effective transport versus at um, half of the density, very little transport. So this is a very preliminary and very rushed <laughs> uh, introduction on our simulation to study uh, particle transport and mixing in microcellulary um, system. And uh, we show there may be an optimal distance between the cluster, uh, clusters for effective directed transport. Uh, asynchrony beats the, uh, reduce the mix, reduce transport, increase mixing. And all these may be potentially relevant to viral or bacterial infection, where we really want maximal directed transport to get them out of the airway as soon as possible and minimal mixing so that they don't get stuck onto the cell surface. Um, and then on the contrary, we want in maybe drug delivery, we want the minimum, we want them to stay in, we want minimum uh, transport and maximum mixing so they can take effect. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll be happy to entertain questions later. Okay, thank you very much. I guess since we have one second, the, does, the, does the transport depend on the particle size? We don't have that yet. Our particle are virtual fluid particles. So it should be. It's, it's, passive, it's a passive, passive tracer. That you yes. Use. Yes. Lovely. Thank you. So we'll, we'll continue with uh, 
our second talk.